the first thing I would like to do is to orient you to what you have in front of you. Um, the first thing you have is the schedule so that you will know um, in hard copy, you will know uh, what school will be presenting um, next after you see a particular school. So that's your first item. Then you have a single page copy of last year's test scores for our elementary schools middle schools and high schools so that you could be able to look at that as they talk about this year's scores and then the large document that you have um, is a copy of each school's presentation that they will bring to you tonight uh, yours is in color mine and mr brown's are in black and white because we were conserving there so um, unless you have further questions um, i would like to to for you to remember that um, on a hard copy in front of you, you have a district uh, in tw 2015 and 2016. It's a white, black and white copy. And you have a 2015 line on the left hand and a 2016 line on the right hand. And at the bottom, you see my handwriting where it says accountability. And there's a strike through that. So that's what I want you to know that is gone. You will never see that again. The accountability tab has been taken off the school report card. So that information there, that's the last time that you will see this because we're moving into a completely new system uh, from this point on. At our next meeting, we will go into that. Um, the, all of the scores that you will see tonight, including those on the single hard copies, are assessment scores only. So it's not an accountability score, it's an assessment score. The scores from the district that you received earlier this week from Mr. Brown, they have only the proficient and distinguished students together. That's the score that you have because that's where we need to be. We only um, put the proficient and distinguished scores combined on those. So on this point, from this point on, we will only look at assessment scores and that's the only tab that you will see on the school report card. So, um, the schools are going to present their information to you as they wanted to. I don't want to tell them how to do that. We gave them a frame. Uh, they looked at what happened last year when they presented or their predecessor presented. They're going to tell you the scores in each content area and then they're going to tell you the why. Why they did well, why maybe they didn't do so well, or any other information that they wish to share. And then they're on to the next steps, or how are they going to achieve proficiency with all students in their building. Um, some students, uh, some schools have chosen to use the apprentice score with their data. So if you see something that I gave you and there is a point or two difference in that particular thing, that school chose to use apprentice. I only gave you proficient and distinguished. So that would be the discrepancy if you see anything like that. Um, other than that, next month we will dive into the new accountability system and the district will share our data with you as well as our preschool and the academy at Horizons because we're all district programs. So we will present together at December meeting. So do you have any further questions until we start with our schools? I would just like to remind the board and everybody else is that this is a different system than what you've been used to in the past and you're it's very i don't want to say not impossible but almost very difficult to compare last year's scores with the information <coughs> that you're getting this year because it's not the same test it's not the same type of data and so you have to be very careful in doing that remember this is last year and this year are baseline scores and on the new system and so we don't want to to compare, it's not apples and apples, it's apples and oranges, so just remember that. Now, there is some similarities, and I'm sure when the when the principals do their report to you all, they will point out some of the similarities and some things that they feel good about and some areas they wanna do. And also, remember that we have new principals in the majority, not in more, most of our buildings have new principals in this, remember where they were last year and where they swore you are this year. So with that, Ms. Brown, we're going to go So first, thank you guys for staying. 
<laughs> Tom, I know we got a 9.30 game, I believe. Hey, I got it taped, so don't worry about it. <laughs> so, yeah. I do have I do have uh, some advantage that I've been at the same place for six years, and uh, this is our sixth year. And I think really it's really fun to listen to stories that I'm hearing from new principals or second year principals. So I think that story is really a big part of of uh, the journey. And I think at our school uh, we've been creating together for the past six years, and I think now more than ever our team feels very empowered. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys have worn a Flight Suit T-shirt, but I would recommend it. I think that there's nothing that's going to make you have a good day quite like Flight Suit T-shirts. You can get them at Apparel Awards for about six dollars and fifty cents. Um, I think if anything that we have done well, uh, that I'm most proud of, is this really this idea of passing the torch from teacher to teacher, but also from teachers to students. And I think. Over the past two years with the shift in our house culture, we feel more uh, confident in this idea that our students have truly passed the torch. At the, the last day of the school year, our seniors passed the torch. This is a picture of the Kentucky Standard last year. They passed the torch to our juniors. And I feel like we're living that more each year authentically than we have the year previous. I say too, I think our teachers in many ways, even though we keep saying work smarter, not harder, we continue, I think, to roll up our sleeves and work as hard as we've ever worked. Uh, well, on one hand, because I think we're inspired. On the other hand, because I think we understand the power in the work. Um, this past year, the, the previous year, we had we had a lot of growth. And this past year, we really focused on this idea of committing to the process. Um, we set goals, and I will tell you, our goals were very high. Um, and we set a process in place that we felt was very important for our teachers and our students to continue to grow. Um, but if you look, it's, it talks about process over product. And I know this is something that. Um, a few of our principals have, have, read a, have read a book called Chop Wood, Carry Water, and it really talks about this idea of process, commit to the process. And I think what you hear is a lot of principals today talking about the process they're going through. Our process, over the past four years, what Robin just called our big rocks for us, have really been what we call our flat closer ecosystem. And they focus on assessment practices, common strategies, culture, and top right is this idea that we are working together to make it happen. I think that the working together piece is, Robin calls professional collaboration, is really a part of how can we work more intelligently together so that we are brilliant with a, with a group of 30 people instead of with one or two people. So I will tell you that as I look at our school and where we're at, and we've been having these conversations throughout the last few weeks uh, with our PLC teams, is this is really not enough. These four things in a sense, are not enough anymore to grow. And I think one thing that we see in our data is that we did the same things, we committed to the same process. The kids changed and in some places our, our data went backwards. So for us, we know we have to be more innovative and thoughtful in our approach in systems and the way we use time and space to, to change the trajectory so we can continue to support students that in some cases are still not growing. So. With that said, I, I think our teachers each year have gotten more thoughtful and creative about engaging a diverse group of kids. I think this picture here, there's so many, there are so many stories in this picture of kids that really, if you think, many, many of you probably know Ms. Peterson, but if you think about her wearing this flight suit and other teachers wearing these flight suits, on, they're, they're telling a story to our kids that no matter what, you can continue to grow and fly closer, and we're, we're in this with you. So last year we thought, and I think at the beginning of the year we thought there was the system was going to stay relatively the same. We thought it was out of you know such and such 100 points. Um, it ended up not being out of 100 points. Uh, it ended up being out of 80 points, and some other things changed. But we had this goal of 90, and, and you know this fireball. We thought it was really exciting. Well, it just kind of that didn't really that didn't really come together. So it didn't come together because of, one, it was not necessarily out of 100 points anymore. But two, um, we didn't meet our goals. Even if we would have. Um, even if it would have been the same system, we would not have met our goals. Um, so I will tell you, while it went down, it wasn't. In some cases, it went up. So if you look, this is a comparison of 2016-2017, and our graduation rate did not have a lot of room to grow. It's actually 98.5 percent. It rounded up to 99. Um, so if you look at CCR graduation rate, those were already relatively high. It wasn't there? Wasn't a a lot of room for growth. We still improve there, and I will tell you that came really from teachers working very closely with students, making sure that as seniors graduate, that they are fully supported. 
if you look at the left side, and this is, so as opposed to some of the other data you're seeing, where you're seeing proficiency data that is um, just proficient and distinguished, we have always, uh, with achievement, we've always had an NAPD, which is Novice Apprentice Proficient Distinguished. So that's 71 is including apprentice students. That's including a half point for apprentice, which is the way the accountability system has always organized it. So you'll see there, we went down nine points in achievement. We went down six points in gap. And that, if you look at that, that the primary loss was in the two key areas of reading and math. And I say loss, but it, was just, it went backwards. You're not comparing the same kids to the same kids. Um, at the same time, we know that we committed the same practices and, and it wasn't as effective. So we have to own that and we have to recognize that in order to meet kids where they are, we have to be more intentional and thoughtful in that process. Um, so that is that's really a summary of year to year. I think it's, for me, um, we've had, we've, since I've been there for six years, we've been able to look at some processes that are really important. The past two years we've committed to this process called Freedom Prep, which has been much more intentional use of time and space for kids based on our school goals. Last year, we did more Freedom Prep than the year previous. With that said, our scores weren't as high. Um, if you look at the five-year EOC comparison, this graph really compares each area, and you'll see a positive trend over a five-year period of time, with the exception, really, of math, which is, which is relatively flat, uh, with the exception of last year in reading, which is relatively flat with the exception of last year and the first year. Um, and I think, that's, I think that reading score is a great example for us as a way that we're not really cohesive enough as a school in servicing kids' needs and thinking about alignment from grade level to grade level or from classroom to classroom because that first group of kids that came in, there was 150 of them. It was one of our smallest classes. And right away, they scored, they, they did really well. Um, it was a, but it was a great example of the work we were doing then in reading wasn't drastically different than the work we were doing last year. Whereas if you look at science, social studies, and writing, you can, I can say with certainty that the work we've been doing in writing has had an impact on achievement over time. Um, ironically, we, I think we have had significant growth in reading over the past year and a half, two years, with a school-wide approach, but it still hasn't shown up in the data. And I think that speaks to a lot of different things. But um, if you look at our GAP students, same way, I think reading and math is where we, we, we have the biggest loss. Um, I think if you look at writing, even though the writing proficiency, we, had, we didn't have as many distinguished writers, our gap writers um, were 62% proficient distinguished, which is something we were very proud of. Um, and I will tell you that a lot, of our, a lot of our issues that we're seeing in reading and writing is not a gap in free and lunch or, or disabilities, it's, a, it's about the gender gap. Our girls are outperforming our boys three to two. So 75% proficient in reading for our girls, 50% for our boys. Um, so five year gap trends, again, it's a positive trend. You can see it looks different in different areas. So where are we not seeing significant growth? Reading, especially with boys. So our girls this year were 75% proficient. Distinguished our boys, sorry, our, uh, yes, and our boys were 50%. That's in the writing piece. So. <laughs> If you look at those, if you look at that gender gap, that that correlates pretty closely, probably around the district in a sense. And we also have significant math issues. If you look at our math scores over the past five years, they were relatively low. They went up last year. Now they're still relatively low. Um, I can tell you that I could I could go back and attribute that to three or four different things. If I talk about math team, they're going to tell you that they're doing more innovative work. That they've been doing more personalized learning and blended learning for kids and their scores went down, which is disappointing because they invested a lot in thinking about how to strategically work with kids and their scores did not increase. So blended learning looks like using Khan Academy for supporting kids. It looks like using different online tools to support kids that may need extra support. So what we found in the blended learning model is that the lower kids are not growing without as much teacher support. So as we might say, here's this, here's this piece of work. They need more direct instruction and small group instruction. And that's something that our math data tells us, and it's something that we see anecdotally in the process. So additionally, last year, this past year especially, I mean, just like I think all schools, novice reduction is a continued area for focus. Um, I think what's been said and what's been said previously is echoed in our learning as a school. Poor practices across the school change the trajectory for students. The more consistent we can be 
the more thoughtful we can be and take care of the most important core practices, like Tanya talked about with meal, like, like Haley's talking about with their reading structure. Those core practices change things for kids because you don't have that residual loss of intelligence from class to class and teacher to teacher and grade level to grade level. So additionally, I think for us, we, we've, we've experimented and innovated with math. We've done the same thing in reading. We've empowered teachers a lot. I think at times we may have taken on a little too much and we have to get back to those essential skills and stay focused on those. And lastly, novice growth requires more time and space intimately with those kids. You have to have more time and space intimate time with those kids. So um, I think this is, this is pretty similar to what we're hearing. I will say one piece that I think this is, a, this is across the district, I think especially over the past few years, we ethically have been very uh, compelled to support students on the ACT. The, the reality for us is our students, if they don't do well on the EOC reading test, can still go to college. This ACT test is something that is really an important piece for kids understanding college acceptance and also thinking about college and career readiness at the state level. Last year we did have a strong year on the, AC, on the, on the ACT and something that we are seeing that kids continue to be very intrinsically invested in. So kids are very motivated towards the ACT because they see how it connects to them transitioning to college. Um, so while our English and readings, our English and math scores went down on the EOC, they went up on the ACT. In some cases, those are the same students. In some cases, it's not, depending on the test. So a little bit of a mystery there. So our ACT growth, too, has been on a positive trend. Our, our last year's graduating class had by far the most ACT growth from plan. Unfortunately, we cannot, we can no longer compare because the state got rid of the plan test. But this was something too we were also really excited about to see that the work and really the work that you guys helped us with as a board and Ms. Brown with the CERT process, this is partly, a, this is the first year we use the CERT program and something that really, um, I think our kids and teachers were able to, to use more creatively because it gave them extra time and space with help. There's a, there's a study, there's a guy that walks you through problems in a way that teachers simply don't have the time to do with every student. So a few things, and I think Tanya spoke to this as well. Graduation rate over a five-year period. 10% graduation rate in a score size, ours was about 10, 10 and a half, 11%, equals about 18 to 20 students in a given year. So for us, that's a Karen Connect class. That's a group of young men or women that are graduating now in our district that, that weren't necessarily graduating six years ago. Um, college and greatness, it says 160% increase you guys play the stock market and you understand it. So this is the percentage of students that are now college ready is 160% more. We went from 38% to 97%. So that's about 100, 110 kids that were college and ready. Gap proficiency as well. We're looking at a smaller number of kids here. So on a given test, you're looking at about 85 or 90 kids taking a given test. We had a 64% increase of students last year that was losing 12 students, moving down to 33% increase over a five year period. So again, these numbers, it was really only a 12% increase, but it was the percentage of students was 33%. This is the same with gap, gap writing proficiency. So over a five year period, increasing gap students, 26% increase, 72% more students were proficient distinguished writers that were in that population. And we feel like this is, this is the data that points us to this idea that coherence is so important. Because the one place, and Robin can speak to this as she worked at Thomas Nelson, the one place we were most coherent and have been most coherent is in the writing practices over the course of the last five years. So with that said, I think we know at the high school level there is so much going on. Everybody's been talking about culture. The big shift we had in the past two years is, in, is this picture right here. Kids are a part of a house and they stay in that house for all four years. They meet with a Care Connect leader, they're with that person for all four years. It is gender-based and it's really organized around caring and connecting with each other. And this has been the single most important change that we've made. Take anything else out about anything we've done in our school, moving to this system is the most important thing that we've done as a school in the past six years. 
because it has engendered a level of capacity in our students to lead and take care of each other that we simply did not have previously because it was very adult driven by the nature of the houses transitioning each year. So this is something we're very proud of. It's been a massive resource undertaking. And I can also tell you that it's been, it, to a degree, I think it in some ways sh shaped our focus to not be as focused on some of the pieces of the academic pie in the way we have been in previous years because it was a massive undertaking. We continue to think creatively and I think now really a lot of this is more student-led. We have six student leadership classes each day that we didn't have last year that are organized around students taking care of each other and celebrating each other. These are student-generated slides that go through our digital announcements. These are processes that we just simply didn't have the capacity for previously. Um, in the end, I think I talked a little bit about, the, about teacher empowerment. I can tell you that teacher empowerment and student empowerment go hand in hand. These are some chalkboards we've had for the last four or five years. It's fun to see them evolve. Kids' stories evolve and grow from freshman year to senior year. I think as a school, in many ways, along with the state right now, we're really in a place where we have to be thinking, what is, what is needed for schools in the next four, five, ten years? Because as you guys know, the accountability system has shifted. And the numbers are shifting, and they will shift. And it is really comes down to what is it that we want to create as a school that in a district that is going to be really essential to moving towards a future that is really separate from the past. And I think this is, this is a slide we use with our teachers a lot because we have a tendency to say, what happened last year? What did we do last year? And I can't stress enough how important this conversation is to our work as a school is we want to have, if we want to have real progress, we have to do new things. We can't just copy things that worked for us last year. We have to create something new in order for us to really grow. So this is a question that drives our work. Um, we talked to our teachers about if it was easy, it's probably not going to work. If it's hard, it's probably something that's going to be really potentially much more meaningful, allow us to learn from it. And then there's this area around how do we get to the next level? Because that's where the human connection comes into place, and that's where the house system and, the, and this, this nature of culture. When people are talking about culture, we're talking about this idea of doing things that we don't even know are possible. And that's what's really exciting. I think this is, at the end of the day, this is really key for, for us. Reading, writing, math, whatever it is, we have to get closer together. And that's where we've had a major investment this year. We allocated about $8,000 for teachers each month to go in each other's classrooms for, a, for just two periods a month. It cost us about $8,000 over the course of a year at our school. But this is an example of a teacher space walking. And the reason we're doing this is for the exact reason we just talked about. In order for them to see what's going on in each other's classrooms, they have to have time to do it. And each month, this is an example of October, this is November, different flight paths, where they're doing these spacewalks, we call them. And it's all about coherence making. We found we weren't giving them enough time to play in the sandbox in each other's classrooms. Talking about it, but we didn't give them space to do it. So this is really a huge piece of our puzzle here. So I think with that idea, uh, we end with this as a school is really, and I think we had some people from the state come in and this was their focus, all means all. And I think for us as a school, in order to get more serious about all means all, from a student percep perception, culture is going to take us to a place that we've gotten to, but really being more intentional about our use of time and space for kids that are not proficient or distinguished is our next step. So with that said, this is where we, this is really the conversation we're having right now. I think the accountability system pushed us to have this conversation more concernedly over the past year. But I think it's really everyone in the state in a sense is at this place. Okay, so the accountability system is changing. What do we stand for? So that's really, I think, the key for us is embracing that conversation. Question? I got a comment. I don't have a question per se. I feel like Thomas Nelson, you're very lucky. You've taken, you're the end result of Boston and New Haven. Although you've taken students from New Haven that hasn't done as well as we hope they would do or expect them to do, right David? And you've made improvements after they reach you. And that's where I consider you very lucky. Like I said, you've taken Boston and New Haven, a very 
uh, two communities and you've made them one community, school community, and you've worked hard to improve their lives and their school um, and their academics. And I would expect no less from that because of what you've started with at Boston and New Haven. I hope you know what I mean. Yes. Yeah, because it would be a waste to me, it would be a waste to know that they've worked that hard at Boston and New Haven, even though we're not seeing the improvement or the, the, the what we wish we could, you know, at New Haven. But you've taken those two and you've made them work even harder to get them ready for college and career. And that, and that I, like I said, I expect no less from that school. And I think you've been lucky because you, you've succeeded in reaching a goal for those kids that has made the, each one of those communities proud. And so I thank you for that. Well, Thomas Nelson is, is a big pride, I think, for me, because they've proven that New Haven can succeed. And you no, know, Mr. Payton just hasn't had the time to get there. It's, it's coming. You know, New Haven will come, but I'm so proud of Thomas Nelson and what they've done for New Haven kids. It's very hard for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. been doing this for 43 years and we have as good yeah. and especially as good a young bunch of building level administrators in this county and uh, you know with all the changes and turmoil you came up and you got to this point with these people I think is a testament of this district's resiliency and for these people and I congratulate them. I mean, you, you, you look, and again, you look around the room and you see some folks that maybe were a pure administrator the year before, or maybe were a classroom or an instructional coach educator before, and, you know, now you're, you're sitting as that administrator in the building. I mean, the resources that are among this team, uh, the ability to rely upon each other, and I'm, I've always thought the hardest thing for any human, forget it being a teacher, any human to do, is to say, I don't really know, can you help me? I mean, it's, and especially as educators, because we're supposed to know the answers, right? And because the kids always go, well, Mr. Bradley, what's the answer? Uh, and, and whenever they were in your classroom, but you know, now we've, we've got these administrators sitting in this room that are willing to look at each other and go, I don't really know what the answer is, can you help me? And it, it, it's just, it's very refreshing to see that. And, and, and also, I mean, not while everybody doing a great job, I have to point out to you, I mean, Ms. Drury and Ms. Hanloser, I mean, both of you all walked into a hornet's nest, I'll just put it simply like that. And the culture changed just in the three and a half months, four months of instruction, plus the time that you all spent, you know, before classes start. I mean, that's tremendous. And while maybe the test scores aren't where, the assessment scores aren't where you want them, those are going to come. Uh, it's going to come for New Haven as well. It's going to come for, for any of the schools that you just don't miss more. It's going to come for Bloomfield. You know, I know you're not happy either, but there were challenges that, you know, you walked into and that you grabbed hold of as well. So it's just, it's very heartening to see such a strong, like you said, strong one of the strongest group of administrative team across the district. Um, and I get to see a lot of districts in Central Kentucky, and I think we've got one of the best ones. And I hope all of you all, I, as a board member, and I know all of us can say this, each presentation there was something that stood out. And if, and I know you all collaborate together, and, and I, I'm glad you all see that other schools, what you found important on one school, you're taking it to your school. Or you're seeing, or, or at least this group to me, you all don't mind sharing 
we've had some that really didn't like to share. And this group is different because you all don't mind to share. I, just like Tanya, I heard you say, Wes helped you. And other other elementaries, you help each other. And that's the way it should be. This, this thinking that you're the only one in the whole by, you're not by yourself because we have three or four schools that need help. I mean, you know, are just now getting back on their feet. And if you can go from there and say, I do need help, then that's, that's to me, that's two thirds of the battle is to get the help. And because we're only helping the kids. You know, I don't care, I, I care about you all, don't get me wrong. But the kids is what counts here. It's not us, it's, it's you all and the kids, and those kids deserve it. We deserve to give Nelson County students the best education we can give them. And being funds are gonna be restricted, I know that, you know that from just listening to our governor. Mm -hmm. And, um, I, you know, I, we just have to pull it, we have to make it work, we have to pull it together and make it work. And I do appreciate all you all help, believe me, I appreciate it. We and we're I going to see you. some positive changes, go visit New Haven, you see what they're oh, doing. There's so much love in that building, go visit uh, Foster Heights, Oak Kentucky Home, every one of you. There's so much love, and they love their students. They don't feel nothing yep. pure love. I know it when and I walk in It's great to see those buildings now thriving. Yes. And positive energy and kids learning. I, I love to see that. Uh, people are respectful and yes. love that. So thank you all. Just keep up the good work. And we also need to thank Ms. Williams and Ms. Brown for their yes. leadership in this process also. So thank we've you. kind of all you. been together. There's a little quiet force behind the scenes. Or yes. <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> what was that? Sometimes quiet. <laughs> <laughs> if you pay ball game day, it's not quiet. That's right. <laughs>